Hello. This presentation will cover the beginnings of projection transformations and an overview of how they work in the OpenGL pipeline. Uh, the topics don't sit any exact one place in the textbook, but they're scattered in a couple places in chapters two and three. So I'll just try to synthesize some of this together. So let's start off by recalling the OpenGL pipeline. Uh, we OpenGL pipeline. We have vertex positions U, I'll call them, and they feed into the OpenGL pipeline. Uh, typically, there's, or possibly, there's a model view matrix M, or a model matrix M, I should say, and then a view matrix V. and then a projection matrix P. The model and view matrices are frequently combined into a single model view matrix, uh, which would be V times M would be the model view matrix. It's also often called just M, though. So we use M both for the model matrix and for the model view matrix, depending on the setting. And what we do with these in the pipeline is this outputs the value of P times V times M times the pos original position U. And the, the code uh, may or may not maintain separate matrices, but the pipeline at the end outputs this value. We'll see where that comes out of the shader program when we're done. And the, the model matrix typically positions objects in three space. The view matrix uh, typically uh, sets the viewer position so that we think of the matrix transforming the position of objects to be in front of the viewer. By default, the viewer is at the origin uh, looking in the negative z direction, down the negative z axis. But the view matrix is used to adjust this. And then the projection matrix um, maps to screen coordinates or, just, or whatever output imagery you have. So what comes out of this is when we do this, these are all 4x4 four four matrices. And they all operate on homogeneous coordinates. So the output of this is a four tuple, x, y, z, w. It's the homogeneous coordinates for some point. What is it the homogeneous coordinates for? It's the four point x over w, y over w, z over w, which we just get as usual for homogeneous coordinates by dividing by the w component. And this gives the location of the point or vertex on the screen in terms of pixels, and also gives the depth value. So this is the position on the screen uh, and a depth value. So the first two coordinates, x over w and y over w, are the position on the screen. So x over w is uh, in the, it's in the interval minus one to one, and this gives the left to right position on the screen. Um, so minus one is on the left side of the screen, plus one is on the right side. Likewise, y over w is in the interval minus one to one, and this is the bottom to top position
minus one is the bottom of the screen, plus one is the top. And z over w is again in the interval minus one to one. And this is the, the depth value. And here, minus one is closest to the viewer. And plus one is farthest from the viewer. Okay. So this is, this is the conventions for these values. So again, the projection matrix, the output of the OpenGL pipeline is a four tuple giving, once you divide by the W values, the position on the screen in the first two components and the depth in the third component. You'll notice that we have a maximum and minimum distance. There's minus one is the closest possible distance to the viewer, plus one is the farthest possible distance to the viewer. And these actually correspond to visual effects you see on the screen here. So if you have depth uh, minus one, this gives us what's known as the near clipping plane. So the near clipping plane is the plane that holds the closest objects that can be seen. Uh, depth of plus one. This gives us the so-called far clipping plane. And anything that's further away than the far clipping plane is not visible in the scene. The triangles, say, are just discarded if they're too far away. Likewise, if they're too close to the viewer, they're also discarded. So you might have seen this if you played computer games before. If you're wandering through some scene and there's a wall, if you, sometimes if you walk up too close to the wall, you'll discover that you can see right through the wall. And it's not that the viewpoint or the camera has passed through the wall, or at least not always. What's, what's happened is you've gotten so close to the wall that it's closer than the near clipping plane, and then the wall is just called away and it's no longer visible, and whatever's behind it is visible. So um, it, it's a slightly strange effect. We do not have any notion of arbitrarily close to the viewer. We cut it off at a certain distance, and anything closer than that just isn't rendered. It just isn't shown at all. So these computations in the OpenGL pipeline typically happen in the following way. The C++ program defines the matrices M, possibly V, and P. And then it sends them to the vertex shader. And I'll show you this code a little bit later. And the vertex shader will do this final computation of multiplying by matrices and compute these x, y, z, w values. The vertex shader then sends those x, y, z, w's back to the OpenGL pipeline. The OpenGL pipeline maps those things to pixels on the screen and then calls the fragment shader for every pixel and whatever is being rendered. And I'll show a little more detailed picture of that on the next board. So I'm going to draw a somewhat simplified version of the OpenGL pipeline as used from the point of view of the shader program. Uh, we'll have two columns here. First of all, there's what the C++ program does. And secondly, there's what the shader program does. And shader programs are written in the language GLSL, which stands for GL shader language. GL stands for graphics language. Um, and uh, we have a vertex shader. And that'll send data down to a fragment shader. And these are separate small programs, or maybe not so small programs, that process data. First, though, the C++ program sets up vertex attributes, uh, such as U, which we're using for position. But there's other possible attributes as well. For instance, we've already been using color. There could be normals, which are normal vectors orthogonal to a surface being rendered, or texture coordinates, which index into a texture. And we will talk more about normals and texture coordinates later in the course. These values get set to the vertex shader. Also, maybe over here, more stuff from the C++ program. 
is we have a M and maybe a V, uh, which are the, the model view matrix or the model matrix and the view matrix, uh, usually just the model, model view matrix, and the projection matrix P. And these are usually what are known as uniform values. So these are values that can be read throughout the shader program. And these are also sent to the vertex shader. And the vertex shader then runs the first stages of the OpenGL pipeline and outputs that four tuple x, y, z, w before, which is representing x over w, y over w, z over w, exactly as before. And this determines pixel locations on the screen. And then the OpenGL pipeline processes that and then sends to the fragment shader. For each pixel, invokes the fragment shader. So this is invoked for every pixel. If we're rendering a triangle, the fragment shader is invoked for every single pixel. And as discussed in earlier presentations, the values that the, of the vertex attributes that get sent to the fragment shader are interpolated or averaged or shaded, as we as all mean the same thing, when they're sent to the fragment shader. And so this is typically what happens. The C++ program creates the vertex attributes such as position. It also creates the model view matrix and the projection matrix. Those are sent to the vertex shader. The vertex shader computes, uh, in this case, since there's only P and M, it'd be P times MU equals that, and then that determines which pixels need to be processed by the fragment shader. And I will pause here and switch to the computer and show you a very simple use of this in the Solar Modern program. Okay, so now we're looking at the Solar Modern program, the version that's on the course web page to see how it uses the projection matrix to map things to the screen. So, as you recall, it uses a model view matrix as before, which is loaded in whenever you draw something such as the sun or the, the moon or the earth and so on. There's also another place where a projection matrix is set, uh, which I've just scrolled down to. So here, there's a command GL set frustum, uh, which we haven't yet learned, but we'll be talking about in future lectures. And this tells it to use perspective to look at the solar system it gives a minimum x value, a maximum x value, a minimum y value, a maximum y value, and a near value and a far value. The near and far values tell you how close objects can be that you can see and how far away objects can be that you can see. Anything closer than the near value or further away than the far value is, is called away and you just don't see it. And then the projection matrix on these two lines here is given to the shader program by exactly the same kind of commands that you used for the model view matrix. We dump the uh, 16 entries in the 4x4 four four matrix to an array called mat entries, and we uh, load it as a uniform variable into the shader program using GL uniform matrix 4F. So now we can switch to the shader program. So this is in the program shader manager slr.cpp. And for the moment, the programs we've been working with all just include the shader program as a C++ string, which is compiled on the fly. Going forward, we're going to switch to using an external file that we read shader programs from, because it makes it a lot easier to modify shader programs. But for the moment, here's our code. And this is the vertex shader right here. And uh, it has two vertex attributes as input. There's the vertex position and the vertex color. They're both uh, VEC3s, which means vectors of length 3. There's an output, which is the color, out, also VEC3. And there's two uniform inputs, the projection matrix and the model view matrix. Um, and the entire code does the following. It takes the vert position, which has x, y, z coordinates. It tacks on a 1 as the w component. And remember that w is what we divide by, so w equal 1 means it doesn't change what point is represented. We form that into a VEC4 
And then we multiply the model view matrix times that, and then the projection matrix times that, and that's the position. This gives us the new x, y, z, w values, which is the position of the vertex on the screen, with x going from minus 1 to 1, y going from minus 1 to 1, and the z value going from minus 1 to 1. Um, and so all that's happening here is these projection and model view matrices that were defined in the C++ code are now in the end multiplying by the homogeneous vector with the x, y, z, 1 values here. The fragment shader could use the uniform matrices, projection matrix and model view matrix, but doesn't. It's a very simple sh fragment shader. All it does is pass through the color without any alterations at all. So we'll be looking at more sophisticated shader programs in the future when we get to lighting. But for the moment, this is about as complex as it gets. Okay, that's all for this presentation. Thank you very much.